Brother Larry and our dear brethren and sisters and our Lord Jesus Christ and dear young people, we would like to take up our considerations in Matthew chapter 12. And it will follow on from what we read in John chapter 8, which you will be aware we did not conclude yesterday afternoon. But in Matthew chapter 12, we read at verse 30 and 31, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. <clears throat> and whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this aeon, neither in the one to come. There are quite obviously two judgment seats referred to here. Not two judgment seats, one judgment and one judgment seat. And as we consider what happened in the life of Abraham and Sarah, particularly after Isaac was born, we know that the son of the bondwoman mocked the son of the free woman. And it's quite obvious by the inferences in John chapter 8 that the origin of Isaac was seriously called in question by Ishmael. Because as we remember, his mother was in the house of Abimelech right on the eve of her conception. And that's quite clear as we go through all the details of the history of this couple. So what was that little boy doing? Well, he was a teenager. He might have been a late teenager. He was full grown. Not that he was totally mature in the things of anything, but he was a grown adult. And what that little boy was doing caused Sarah to say, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the bondwoman will not, the bond slave will not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And as we said, she was looking down the stream of time a long way into the future and she was under the Spirit because Paul tells us in Galatians 4 that the Scripture said, cast out the bondwoman and her son. That was an inspired comment by Sarah. And she meant that those two parties would never inherit together. Why not? Well, there is one thing brethren and sisters and young people, that will prevent inheritance forever. And it's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That is the thing for which there is never forgiveness. What is it? Let us read these verses again. <clears throat> All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto, them, unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall never be forgiven. What is the blasphemy? What was Ishmael saying? He was not simply speaking a word against the Son. He's speaking a word against the origin of the Son. And when we look at these verses here, class members, we can see the very great seriousness of ever denying the full meaning of the divine begettal of the Son of God. And if there is not due weight given to that doctrine... It is quite clear that the end result is being cast out forever. That's a very serious matter in our lives. A very serious matter. Because we are just as capable today as Ishmael was in his day of speaking a word against the origin of the son of Yahweh. It's just as easy to do. We may admit he's the Son of God in words. And so do plenty of people out there. 
but what real meaning and place and power do they give it? What real meaning of place and power do we give it? Do we erode the power of the Spirit within Him? Do we diminish the effects of the divine, of the divine begettal? It's a serious question for us. And when we conclude those words in John chapter 8, to which we'll turn for a moment now, in John chapter 8, verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, the diabolos. Ye are of your father the diabolos. And the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, that's his responsibility. He speaks of his own. He's the liar and the father of it. And as we look at the context of these words, brethren and sisters, this is not talking about Cain and Abel. This is not talking about the murderous intent of Cain. Because the whole dialogue here is centered between the leaders of the Jews and the Son of God. And they are both claiming that they are the descendants of Abram. And the Lord Jesus Christ winds up and he says, I can tell you that there is one feature that determines lineage from Abram. And that is whether you do the works of Abraham, whether you have the same faith as Abraham. I don't care what sort of a genealogy you can prove to me. There's only one way that I establish relationships, and that is the faith and the works of the individual concerned. And if you are not doing the works of Abraham, then you can only have come from one other source, and that is ye are of your father the Diabolos. The diabolos, which cannot hear the word of God, it is not subject to it, neither indeed can be. And there is only one way to do that, and that is, brethren and sisters and young people, to get an entirely new way of thinking. And these men were the most religious men on the earth in the day, in the day of Christ. And he dares to say to them, and he says it to them in truth, you are so filled with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life, that there's absolutely no room to squeeze in anything else. You've completely overshadowed my words, the word of God. You've made them of none effect by your tradition. You've actually eroded the power of the word in your lives. You've taken away from it. You've sowed something in it that makes it unpalatable. And therefore... You are of, your, are of your father the devil. And when we look now at Ishmael, brothers and sisters, and you can see the wonderful parallels that are here between the lives of Isaac and Ishmael and Christ and the leaders of the Jews, it is clear, it is oh so patent that Ishmael wanted to get rid of his young brother at a very early age. He had murderous intent against him. Because he hated the fact that Abraham was his father and he quite, quite deliberately cast aspersions on the origin of Isaac. He could speak a word against Isaac and it could be forgiven him. But he cast aspersions on the origin of Isaac and that was his death knell. And that's why it was said, cast out the bondwoman and her son. And this man will never be heir with the son of the free woman. Now they are everlasting principles, brothers and sisters, in every age of the truth's existence from Cain and Abel to now. Because when we think about that allegory in Galatians chapter 4, it finishes up by saying that even as the son, the seed of the flesh, persecuted the seed which was of the spirit, even so it is now. And that's an everlasting statement. What do we expect, brethren and sisters and young people, if we stand up for what is right? What do we expect? Do we expect any better than Abel got? 
Do we expect any better than any of the prophets got? Do we expect any better than Christ received? Do we expect any better than the apostles received? It's life and death, brethren and sisters. Young people, it's life and death. Choose the good and hate the evil because it's life and death that has been set before us. And the principles are oh so clear in the lives of these two sons of Abraham among whom was set up a bitter resentment because as soon as Isaac came into being, Ishmael and Hagar knew that he would inherit the promises. And that is a, it is a promise from Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth. Come to verse 17 of chapter 13, uh, sorry, verse 15 of chapter 13. For all the land which thou seest, to thee, to thee will I give it. Back in chapter 12 and verse 7, it was unto thy seed will I give this land. Now it is unto thee will I give it. And again in verse 17, arise and walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. That's not covenant, brethren and sisters. That's promise. And we're starting to see that there is a profound difference between covenant and promise. Brethren and sisters, we introduced it yesterday. You will find that among the unamended community, there is very strong, very strong emphasis on legality. The blood of the covenant the place of the Abrahamic covenant in the salvation of mankind. It's all emphasized on legality. There was a legal effect that passed through from Adam to all his progeny. It's all legal, legal, legal. There's nothing legal whatsoever about the work of God in Christ. It is all a healing process that is based entirely in love and mercy and grace. The systems are opposed. They are violently opposed. And we need to stand up. Brothers and sisters, there's a little verse in, in Exodus, I think it's 21, and it says, don't follow a multitude to do sin. Don't make out that when the issues come up, don't make out, don't decline in your judgment to side with the majority. That's what the Bible says. Where has there been in the history of the truth a great majority that stood for the right things? Look at all the history of, of Israel. Look at the times of our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles. What happened to them? Do we expect any better? Are we prepared to take what they received? And what was their crime? They stood for what their God said. That's all their crime was. And they received what they got because of the hatred of the flesh of people who claimed to be in the truth as the leaders of Israel claimed in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he completely demolished their argument, and he looked at the incidents of Isaac and Ishmael, and he said, here we've got another image of the same thing. I am of my father. You are of your father. The fathers are poles apart, because that one was the Diabolos, and this one was the deity. So we continue on in chapter 15 of Genesis. And verse 7 says, He said unto him, I am Yahweh that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land. Young people, do a little exercise, very simple. Just go through and colour in so that you can see it in future the little words to give or have given as we read it in verse 18. 
In the same day Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. From the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. How do we marry these ideas? Why does Yahweh make a covenant with Abram? Well, if we go back to the beginning of this, brethren and sisters, verse 6 concluded with that lovely result of Abram and Yahweh becoming friends because of the degree of the maturity of faith that Abram had expressed in accepting that Yahweh could bring out of his bowels a multitude that is as many as the stars of heaven. I believe that, said, Yah said Abram. And then verse 7 turns around and it says, I am Yahweh that brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. To give thee this land to inherit it. Can you inherit a covenant? You can only inherit a promise. So what does Abram say in response to that? He said, Adonai Yahweh, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Give me a guarantee that I will inherit it. In modern parlance, show me the title deeds. Show me the title deeds in your name and I'll accept. Brethren and sisters, you can see the end result. Yahweh made a covenant with Abram. And it was all about a doubt that Abram had about inheriting the land. He had no problems about the seed. But he obviously had a difficulty about the land. So what does Yahweh do? Abraham, he says, take me a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all of these and divided them in the midst and laid each one against another, but the birds he divided not. So just as we read in Jeremiah chapter 34 about the way that they cut the calf in twain and the parties to the covenant walked between the pieces of the victim. And the covenant was ratified. So Yahweh has prescribed for Abram to take certain animals and birds to divide them asunder. And then what happens? The fowls came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. He's in the sleep of death. And he said to Abram, No of a surety, no of a surety, that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them a four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, thy people shall come hither again. Because at the moment the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, brothers and sisters, we have to examine it very carefully as the next verse comes into play. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces. The smoking furnace and the burning lamp obviously the representatives of Yahweh himself went between the pieces of the animal. And it says nothing about Abram going between the pieces. He didn't go between the pieces. 
It's a very one-sided thing, brothers and sisters. And it's all done because Abram asked his friend, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit That's not faith, brothers and sisters. That's knowledge. He wants to have a watertight guarantee that what the promises told him will be followed up and they will be dispensed. And then we read in verse 18, in the same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram. It never says that Abram made a covenant with Yahweh. Why not? Because Abram didn't go between the pieces. He drove, he made the offerings, he selected the offerings as prescribed, and he did what was supposed to be done for the formation of a covenant, but he never passed between the pieces. And the record, you can search in vain, brothers and sisters, in the record for the idea of Abram making a covenant with Yahweh. And then we begin to think this through and we say, here is the majesty of the heavens. He's made a promise to his friend Abram and he's doubted. What would Yahweh do? How far would he go? Well, he went, brothers and sisters, to the extent of severing himself He could swear by no greater. He swore by himself with an oath that the promises that he had made to Abraham concerning Abram's seed and himself personally, he'd made the promises about both of those subjects being inheritors of that land, and then he is prepared to go, as it were, the second mile. And he's gone the second mile now. And he's passed between the pieces. And Abram's watching on with glowing eyes. And he sees in the eerie darkness the smoking furnace and the burning lamp pass between the pieces. And in the same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham. And what was the covenant all about? The covenant was all about the rest of verse 18 unto thy seed have 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 I given this land see brothers and sisters Abram wanted a surety he wanted to be sure and Yahweh can't do anything better than he did he said look Abram unto thy seed I've already given him the land I've done it. It's over and done with. And I am prepared to seven myself because I can swear by no greater that I will do what I promised to you, Abram, and to your seed. I think, brothers and sisters, we can see again the grandeur of the friendship between those two individuals. It was so close that Yahweh would do anything to convince this man who he brought out of Ur of the Chaldees. Now, that's not enough, brothers and sisters. It's not enough. Because if we now turn over to Galatians chapter 3, we will find that the Apostle Paul is inspired to say quite a bit about this matter. In Galatians chapter 3. And we'll start at verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise, the promise of the eternal spirit through faith. 
And then he says in verse 15, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Even if it is a man's covenant, if it is confirmed, if it is consummated, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. So now, after first telling us that the Gentiles are enabled through Jesus Christ to receive the promise of the eternal spirit through their faith, now he says, let's have a look at a covenant. He's telling us about the unbreakable nature of the covenant. Even if it is just a man's covenant let alone Yahweh's covenant with Abram. And then verse 16 comes along. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of, to, as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God cross out the words in Christ because they are not there, the covenant that was confirmed before of God, the law, and he's not therefore talking about the covenant of Moses at Horeb. He's talking about the covenant made with Abraham. And he says that the covenant that was confirmed before by God, the law, which is 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. He has clearly, brothers and sisters, graded promise and covenant. Promise is higher than covenant. And there's nothing legal about a promise. There is something legal about a covenant. But there's nothing legal about a promise. And so we read on. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained it by angels in the hand of a mediator. So what has the Spirit in Paul done in this little passage? He's looking at two things. He's looking at promise and he's looking at covenant. And it's obvious that he winds up by placing heavy ev ev emphasis on the promise. The promise. The promise. It's the promise. Now, if that was all we could turn to, we might have already arrived at the conclusion, brethren and sisters, that the covenant has nothing to do with their inheritance. And it doesn't. The covenant is simply there to make an end of all strife as the Apostle Paul is inspired to say in Hebrews, to which we'll turn, he says, as far as men are concerned, when they see the ink on the page or on the paper, on the, on the document, they're happy. That's what men want to see. they got legal minds. But that's not the mind of Yahweh. So we come over to Hebrews chapter 6. And we read that the inspiration of God in Paul fits perfectly with what we've seen out of the Genesis record. It fits perfectly what we've seen out of the Galatians 3 record. And we read in verse 13. Perhaps we ought to go back a little bit further. Verse 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And when God made promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by any greater, he swore by himself, saying, 
and he's taking us to Genesis chapter 22. And so, verse 15, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the unbreakable nature of that counsel, confirmed it by an oath. In the same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram. He swore by himself, as he did again in Genesis chapter 22, when Abram offered up Isaac, his son. He did the same thing again. And he swore by an oath, because he could swear by no greater. He swore by himself. He confirmed the promise with an oath, with a covenant. And it's very, very obvious, brothers and sisters, that the covenant takes second place as it ought to do. I wonder, brethren and sisters, if we could offer the deity a more heavy stroke than denying his promise. Ought that not be enough? Well, it goes on to say in verse 18, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. What are the two things? It's rather obvious, isn't it? That it's promise and covenant. By two things. In the mouth of two witnesses, let everything be established because it's only for men's weaknesses. It's only for men's disbelief that Yahweh ever went the second mile and confirmed his promises with an unbreakable oath of his own existence. What a mighty God we have, brethren and sisters. I wonder how we would have got on with just the promise. I wonder if we would have accepted it. Would we have had greater faith than Abram in those matters? Abram's faith never wavered when a seed was being spoken about. And so we come back to Galatians chapter 3 again. And we come to the end of the chapter. And in Galatians chapter 3, and we could with profit read all of the rest of this chapter from which we have already quoted a few verses. Paul continues on in the next couple of verses and he shows to us irrevocably the superiority of the promise over the covenant. And then we come into verse 25, verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. Cross out the next three words because they are not there in the original and they don't do the do service to the truth of this verse. The law was our schoolmaster until Christ. That's in harmony with what we have read back in verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. And the argument that the Apostle Paul is using from this verse on is to say that the law was a temporary thing till Christ came. And it's very clear that that argument is used in almost every verse from verse 21 down to verse 24 from which we are now reading. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. And what did the schoolmaster do? Well, it didn't, it didn't open up our minds. He had actually shut them down. As verse 23 says, under the law, we were shut up to things which would afterwards be revealed. 
So now we're looking at the schoolmaster. The law is our schoolmaster. It's not an enlightener, it's a deadener. It prevents people seeing things. Just like Moses had a veil over his face when he came down from the mount, so that the people of Israel could not behold the end for which the law was set in motion. They couldn't see it. And the law is a schoolmaster until Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith, after that the faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and your heirs according to the promise, not covenant. Your heirs according to the promise. And that's the finality of Paul's consideration of this matter. You're all heirs according to the promise. Because you don't inherit a covenant. A covenant is only of use between the two parties that originally made it. It's a legal thing. There's nothing legal about being accepted at the judgment seat of Christ. There's no such thing as adding up this column and adding up that column and seeing that this column overshadows that column and therefore, oh, you're in. Nothing like that, brothers and sisters. There's nothing legal about it. But, may I say it again? The system of the unamended community is entirely based on legalism. It's got an extremely wrong foundation. And it's all based on that. And if you analyse it carefully, brothers and sisters, you will come to that conclusion very readily. That's the basis of that community. And it's not the basis of our community. The basis of our community is that God so loved the cosmos that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the cosmos is not all those people out there. It's every person who from the days of Adam, after he's expelled from the garden, it's every person who's got the same brand of faith that Abraham had, to believe in the promises, even though it was not unshakable for a while. And Yahweh gave him the certainty that he would inherit the promises. And how is Abram going to inherit? There's only one way that Abram can inherit. And we turn back to Romans chapter 15 to see it. In Romans chapter 15. <coughs> and at verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises, to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Remember, brethren and sisters, to whom the promise of the land was first made in Genesis 12, verse 7? Unto thy seed will I give this land. And in the day that Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham, he made the covenant with Abraham saying, unto thy seed have I given this land. He came to confirm the promises made unto Abraham. And he is the very first beneficiary of that work, apart from his father who was very greatly benefited by the work of, of Christ on that tree. We need to remember a, a divine order, brethren and sisters. It's a, it's a hierarchy, if you like. And it's Yahweh, it's Christ, and it's us. And you can be absolutely certain 
that everything that is accomplished by God in this book is first for him, secondarily for him, and thirdly for us. That's the whole emphasis that we ought to put on the whole of the Bible. Because if Jesus Christ did not die the death he died at the commandment of his Father, how much further could the Father's purpose proceed? Not another millimetre. It couldn't go any further. And he was therefore the first beneficiary of the work of his own son, of course inspired greatly by the divine begettal and the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and fear that was placed upon him at his birth by his divine begettal. And when we read such words as these, brothers and sisters, as we do in verse 8 of Galatians chapter 3, we can see the essence of the gospel. It's embedded in the promises. It's not embedded in the covenant. What benefit, brothers and sisters, have we actually been able to get from the covenant that Yahweh made with Abraham? Well, I suppose exactly the same as Abraham. It made the promises sure and it was not ever needed to be done the moment we start to emphasize the covenant what have we done we've eroded the power that is in the promises and we need to be very careful brothers and sisters and young people that we elevate the things that God elevates and that we take hold of that hope which is set before us because that hope will only ever come about by Jesus Christ becoming the inheritor of all the promises because it was promised to him before it was promised to Abram. And it is only through his exalted seed, the Son of God, it is only through that man that Abraham or anybody else will ever inherit the promises.